Hello guys, this is Good Like, and we're back to Let's Code once more. Part 15, complete. In 14, we divided by zero, accidentally, and fixed it on, on, on camera. <sighs> yeah, the mostly we're working on the launcher logic being extracted in the most sophisticated way. State-of-the-art techniques were used, and some such. But for today, we're doing some good old testing. Yes, that's much more interesting, I'm sure. So, let's see. In the first of my commits, I extract the skeleton of the CMD application. Whoa. That's crazy. Uh, well, I did this without writing any tests, because this is quite simple. So what did I do, in fact? I created two interfaces. Let's look at the application UI first. So the application UI interface, as you can see, has all kinds of methods that relate to what the UI does. The signal unknown command, presumably we entered an unknown command, and that's kind of the point. I, I didn't want to make these methods too ridiculously long, if possible. All these other methods are quite similar. What the browser settings, what the max result, and so on and so forth. How did I get these methods? I pulled them out of my ass? Hell no, I pulled them out of main. Uh, main, 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 as you can see, has been reduced to very small, uh, or well, whatever program that barely does anything. M mainly what it does, it still prints introductions and outros, but uh, a lot of its logic, in fact, all of its logic, as far as logic can be considered, has been punted all the way into the CMD application. And uh, all that we do here is perform the application loop, which reads the input, and then if it's not null, we push that input to the application. The interface that I created was specifically created for the purpose of replacing all of these kind of calls, where we do something with the UI, which in our case is a command line, but it's, it's still a UI, it's still, it's still an interface, you know. A user is using it somewhere, I'm sure. And uh, there's quite a few of these, but actually, if if you go, it's it's exactly this many. This is the amount of things that can actually happen in the application, or, well, could happen in the application as we wrote it. The implementation of the, not main profile, sorry, the uh, CMD UI, there we go specifically that. It just prints a bunch of things. The structure of this class is very similar to what we did in the previous episode with the listener. In this case, we're not dealing with a piece of functionality that we may want to handle in many different ways. We're dealing with a full-fledged, complete application, and we just want to separate it from the interface with which it works. And uh, that's the point of this interface. It allows you to basically not have any system out print lines at all in your application. All the logic is here in this class, and uh, as you can see, all the calls to command line are replaced with signals to the UI class, signal of browser setting, and so on and so forth. All the other code remains unchanged, including all the things that we built. We just get the profile, which I'll show you in a moment what it does. But the main point is that with these, if you implement them with something else, you could use the application in literally any application, because these are all the UI interactions. So if I wanted to, I could implement this with something like Swing, and then we could have a Swing application, and it'd be rubbish probably, because why would you use Swing for something that easily works with CMD? The main point of this wasn't just to do that, the main point of this was to extract also the profile, as I like to call it. The profile is what I call essentially all the set of things objects or what have you that are external to the application. So the UI is obviously external. The name, well, yeah, it's 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 kind of like a configuration variable. You could put it somewhere else, but I put it here because I didn't want to create too many interfaces. Uh, the HTTP transport is obviously external to the application. 
you could say maybe it's a bit more tired, but even then, you, you can easily state that HTTP is something outside of the realm of your application. You're making HTTP calls, you're getting responses through that, but what happens beyond that point is, you know, none of your business. You just have a contract, uh, you know, an API contract usually, but it's it's not part of your application, strictly speaking. Same with the launchers, you know, you have launchers like launching browser, launching copying by by co launch by copying to clipboard these things like clipboard and the launcher are separate and um i must admit that i sort of may have made a little bit of a i wouldn't say a mistake but a kind of a, a simplification what i could have done is i could have used instead of link launcher interface i could have passed in the desktop passed in the clipboard itself and then used uh, these uh, constructors and pass in whatever I get from the profile and then all of the logic in here would be checked. So this isn't a trivial question to answer. Which way to go really depends on first of all how confident you are in your tests and second of all uh, how fluid is the application. I think in this case you could see a contradictory decision in the UI. So in the UI I have a method which prints an item which has a description and uh, an item. So what does this uh, look like in the UI, we can actually run the UI and I'll show you, because why not? Just to show that this still works, guys, you know, maybe I should always start these videos with running the tests. Well, it's kind of pointless, because we're already done. So let's say I do, you know, something, and this, these are printed out as a result of calling the application UI method print item. I pass in the description and the item, and, uh, the description is everything before the colon, and the item is then something that's transformed into the right side of the colon. So as you can see, some part of the UI has technically leaked into our application, because uh, our application makes sure that all of these numbers are aligned. But in other applications, that might not be a concern, because you don't care about the alignment, let's say, into pop-ups or whatever, or in some kind of different uh, ordered lists. So you could say, for example, that I should maybe give an index, maybe give a max index, maybe give, uh, maybe just straight up give the whole list and uh, the description and let the UI print all of this out however it wants, which I think would be one very reasonable suggestion. Why didn't I do that? You know, why, why not? If it sounds as good, because there's really no big point of meaning to it. This application is mostly for demonstrational purposes. It's not going to be used. Its logic will also probably not be used anywhere else. I'm just doing this to, like I said, to create a separate profile for uh, when I'm going to test the application a few more commits later. And in that case, all I need to look at is comparing the current application with the testing application and that's basically what I extract here, you know, uh, from for the UI. It's the simplest thing is just printing, right? Very easy. And for the profile, I chose uh, on the flip side. I didn't choose to go all the way to desktop and clipboard. I chose link launcher. I think you could go either way. It would just mean that your tests would cover slightly more ground. And I think it's fair to say one way or the other, but on the flip side, your application would become less flexible because you, you, you wouldn't be able to change the, the default launchers for browser and that one's for clipboard. And you never really know which one is the best one. And I would say that in this case, maybe I should have done desktop and clipboard to not be contradictory with the application choice where I didn't go for the flexibility on the application side. And here I go for the flexibility on the application side. But, uh, I don't think like this is, uh, going to have any grand implications because once again, link launcher is just tested separately anyway. But, uh, I suppose if you really want to get 100% correct, then that would have been more appropriate at the time. Uh, certainly you can't say that this is correct, that maybe you want, uh, why can't you use the argument of flexibility in this case? Because that would be over engineering. You, 
you can never truly predict what you will you want flexible in an application. I can say you with 100% certain that I definitely won't want much more. Maybe there'll be one more launcher like for something else. But uh, there will still be a kind of a hierarchy that I want to have at all times. So this flexibility really isn't necessary right now because I don't have any plans to use the application. The only reason I'm doing this is for testing purposes and my test application can mock either one just fine, but uh, it would be better to mock something deeper because you will cover more of it with the tests or whatever. But what's done is done. I ain't gonna fix this. It's fine. For the purposes of this, I also added is browser available and is clipboard available methods, which are in main now or somewhere at the bottom here. As you can see, we had is browser supported. Now I just have a separate default browser behavior in which we also say that maybe clipboard isn't supported which was something we didn't do previously because we had demi and stuff uh, and now you know that that became useful i don't really test those because they're so incredibly trivial they're only used in the ui and uh, testing them would probably be the pain in the butt because all of this is static bullshit and that's the point of it, to tell the application that some static bullshit is available. So, it, it, eh, you, you can't really do it right here. The main profile provides uh, the original implementations of reviews, as we would use them in the application. CMDY being the only new addition, uh, but the subbox for the name, we have the client from the main constructor with the request debug and provider of the key. And we also have the link browser, link paste, and main launcher listener, which is an old class from a long time ago. No, actually from last time. Here, I deferred the evaluation of these things. I noticed the tests take a little bit of time to start, so I thought maybe it's because we're building some kind of a, you know, expensive desktop object as we load this class which we may not even need because in tests we are never actually using the real desktop. So that's one way to do it. So I decided to memoize the static method and then just, you know, get it, which means that it will be loaded the first time and it will remain loaded. Unfortunately, that didn't affect test time. As you would expect, these random optimizations almost never help. The only optimizations I've ever seen to help test is, if, is when you use clearly crappy ways to do things like when you do reflection and you do it a billion fucking times or something or when you use something like an x path and just do it once again a billion fucking times when you could have just built the model out and then gotten the values out for testing like those were actually significant increases but anything else than that which is basically calling shit that you don't need over and over billions of times is not gonna have a real effect but nonetheless, I mean, it, it, it doesn't hurt. I mean, yeah. I changed the mock layout. Yes. Originally, if you recall, it was in test, uh, config and we had, uh, HTTP and then in HTTP was everything that was in data and then deeper yet was error. Instead, I opted for a more flat layout because it's kind of easier to manage. I also made sure to make uh, this explicitly the test HTTP pack uh, well it's not really a package it's a source root because um, we're really only putting HTTP JSON values here so we might as well name it that and if we have something else we'll just make a new root right and then came the acceptance tests for which all of these acceptance exists I do reuse some especially errors and a few of the data uh, JSONs, and I don't just use all these here, but these here are for testing something that might be a little bit too annoying otherwise. For example, search one is something I don't think I may have. Well, I have this, which is basically the same, but uh, search 13, which is the default, definitely don't have that. I added another method, signal rule result from channel search. Apparently, in our application, we would never search for we wouldn't handle the case where channel is empty i believe that this is because in practice this is impossible i think if you put any search in you will always get something and we always limit max results to at least one so you can't i i don't know if it would work if you 
gave it zero, but we don't allow that anyway, so even if it could get to work that way, it wouldn't work in our case. But theoretically, theoretically it could return empty and then we would have no output and that would be confusing if it's one thing to do in your UIs. Whenever something produces no output, always put some kind of signal or message there because it's confusing when nothing's shown after you put an input. You don't know if the application works or is like what happened. You need to know that the application works in a specific way, and when you need to know that, you know your application sucks. In test profile, I initialize all the mocks and then I return them here because I will presumably I wanted to make use of the getters so that you know, you wouldn't constantly get new value, but for cases like application name or the transport, which I don't look at with Mokito, they don't matter. I initialize these to basically perfection, so that it always works, it's true, they always work, but uh, later on I'll override those if I need to in the tests. There's a bunch of assertion methods and stuff like that, and... Uh, a reset, so, so that you can reset all the mocks. Yay. Okay, so what are the tests? The tests ignore this cavalcade, which basically just creates profile, the application, and a bunch of objects that we can make use of. Uh, you could probably put these into static if you wanted to. I don't think anything bad would happen, because these are just search results, which are usually value objects. Maybe they contain YouTube, but it will always be reset before every call. If you go down to the bottom, as you can see, we always reset in the default case. And I only don't reset in those cases where I have one call, and before the call, I need to initialize some crap. So, yeah. Anyway, so how does these tests work? So I just have a array of inputs that I pass into the application and then I check what does the application signal on the UI. So if you enter some bullshit, it's an unknown command. If you enter max 25, we'll change the results to 25. Note that we don't test here whether we get the actual change in the application for 25 because that's not important here, honestly. What's important is that we have the signal. We will test whether we get that or not later on. So here the same with invalid, 0, 100. Changing to browser settings. This is a case where I do a input, see what happens, do an input, see what happens. Uh, and here is a case where I do the opposite, where I do two inputs and then I see what happens. Uh, the difference is basically that I expect these to be done in chunks. Like if you change a browser, you're probably doing once and then that's it. Whereas these are more of something that you could do one after the other reasonably in the application. So if you just enter ticket like 13 by default, you get 13 channels, all of which are the good like. That's actually very accurate. That's exactly how it works. This is the case uh, where, which I added to the UI where, you know, the channel apparently doesn't exist, so no result. All of this is powered, by the way, by mock HTTP. So we have a bunch of uh, mocks, which we're really putting that uh, mock HTTP transport to work with this one. We're basically like mocking four different APIs. There's, uh, there's all kinds of like default states and everything. It's, it's, it's really fucking doing work in this one. I, I gotta tell you that. Anyway, after that, we check the channel only one. So we set the max and then we do the good like and then we only get one result. Then we do find players. All of this is basically more or less, I believe, in order of the way that we present it in main. I think. Yeah, I do believe so. Obviously, we don't present a known command, but that's just trivial, and the rest are, I think, in the order they appear in our main application when you launch it over here. So, like, yeah. Max, then browser flipping, then channel, and playlist, and so on and so forth. All right, so we find a playlist. For this one, I wanted to check that uh, the padding would go to three, because there's 100 plus videos. So, as you can see, it works. Uh, actually, don't because we haven't run the test. We'll do that in a moment. Uh, so playlist deleted, 
this is the deleted playlist. We get a warning that playlist with ID deleted uh, is not found. Private playlist with ID private is private. Video, we select a video and then we launch it with the browser. This is what this true indicates. Next up is missing video. We just output missing. Then we switch to clipboard and we do this. We signal still that the browser resetting was changed. And then with the second thing, we once again print select item, but we use the clipboard instead of browser. Then we do a double switch. Yeah. And once again, we use the browser. What if it fails? Oh, well, then we will use both the browser and the clipboard. <laughs> but you didn't expect that one. The only difference between this and this is that we, yeah, I don't know if we actually print this. We probably do print this here as well. So maybe I should add it and then we'll see. Maybe these tests will fail and we'll be all like, what the fuck? I forgot all about it. That is not the correct test. That is also not the correct test. That is the correct test. Okay, let's continue here. Why am I even going into this convoluted menu? There's no way for me to actually make my desktop and browser unsupported without relaunching and doing some shenanigans. So I'm not even going to go there. Let's just see what the tests will tell us. Yeah. So after that, we do select search result. I will, for all of these, I will use max one. So I don't have to have like, you know, check a lot of these printings. I do want to check all of these because to me, this is like a one big session of things that you do like here. You know, I would input, uh, if I input this, I s this, then do this, no, not te. And then I would do cn equals to one, which I'm not going to do because it's going to be long and annoying. I would still expect to see all of these outputs. So that's why I still check for them, but I may not check for like, uh, something like that. There was only one item because that's a little bit redundant. I only care that the, in this case that UI outputs the stuff, not that it necessarily is 100% correct, because the other tests test for that. Let's also make sure that no inputs get lost in our input method somehow, magically. You never know, someone could just fuck that up. There's a little bit of uh, repetition similar to how we entered the number previously. So now we're also entering a number. So we have invalid, zero, two cases, which... Uh, well, have all kinds of various signals. Then we do some special cases where the channels are deleted or banned in the middle of a search. It can happen, uh, very unlikely, but it's not technically impossible. So I decided to make sure that those are included. Then we have select video over playlist. Once again, we set up a playlist and we set up this stuff. I've realized that we're actually missing some very important tests. So let's do them right now, live again. We're missing a test for the case where we select search result before searching. How did I miss this? So what does this look like? We just basically input this as the only thing into the application. What would we expect? We would expect the UI to give us uh, a signal that uh, we have not done in each search. Conversely, I want the very similar test at the end, except with VNs instead of CNs and signal no previous playlist. This would be select uh, video. So for playlist, we have a bunch of select video from playlist when you do the case with the playlists ID. And then we have the special case of select video from channel, which is like the full flow. Basically, you, you go all the way from setting that, doing a search, doing, selecting a specific uh, channel from the search results, and then picking a specific video. So that's what this is for. And we, I only check the good case. I don't check once again, for example, what will happen if we switch the browser in here or whatever. Because I, I, I think at that point, that's a little bit redundant as well. I'm confident also enough that it would be really hard to break that specific case while, you know, not breaking all these other tests where we did test for browser switching. So I left that alone, just went for integer checks, which uh, 
you once again could say maybe, maybe there's a case for not doing that. The way I see it, okay, the reason why I felt like doing these but I didn't feel like doing the other ones is because this number is part of the query that we're testing. So if it's invalid, that's technically something new, whereas we already tested what happens with uh, the browser behavior? We just used uh, a different type. Uh, you can maybe make a case that one of these should also be tested just in case. One of these two cases of uh, either selecting video or that. But the way I see that these tests are mostly for the uh, browser behavior, not for testing specifically that the video launches. We kind of already have that. It's just, uh, th that's the way I see it. And, uh, again, it's just weighing your options of uh, how much do you really want to spend writing these. Uh, normally, actually, you would write these first, right? You know, test driven development and all. And then uh, you would naturally come up at the answer at the point where everything would just work the way you want it to work and you could stop. But since I did this backwards, I, you know, have a little bit of a leeway on picking and choosing what I want to handle and what I don't want to handle. And I have just that sense that it makes sense to go the extra mile for something that's part of the actual query you're testing. It doesn't necessarily make sense to go the extra mile for combinations of queries. I think that if they work with one combination, they're probably going to work with the other combination because that's the point of the query. That's what I think. Feel free to disagree, of course. All right, so with that, all our tests are done. And in the last commit, I just decided to add these visible for testing annotations because I started using them and I thought, why not? Let's, let's go through it and put them in. It's better than a comment. The time has come.